This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Stick around to find out how you can get two months free membership. Welcome to CS Guitars, the science of loud. Today I'm giving some love to the tiny tatas, the questions oft overlooked because they have answers so simple they wouldn't fill a video on their own. I've lined up five of the most common questions with tiny answers that you have been too afraid to ask. Alnico is the name given to a certain type of magnet that we often use in guitar pickups and speakers. Invented in the 1930s, these were the first real high-performance permanent magnets, vastly superior to the magnetic steels which came before. They come in many different varieties, or more accurately, grades, each with their own subtly different magnetic properties which we differentiate by giving them numbers. Alnico's 2 and 5 are probably the most common, but 3, 4 and 8 are also regularly used in guitar pickups. To understand these numbers, we must firstly understand the chemistry behind the magnet itself. Obviously, being magnetic, iron is a major component of an Alnico magnet, but iron alone won't hold its magnetism permanently. For the material to stay magnetic, we need to form an alloy, mixing in other elements to help improve its magnetic properties. These main elements are aluminium, nickel and cobalt, hence the name Alnico. By changing the ratio of how much of each element is present in the alloy, the final magnetic properties of the magnet are decided. There are many resources online which will give you the mix ratios and the magnetic properties of each Alnico grade, but to keep things simple for this explanation here, as the grade number increases, so too does the magnetic strength. For example, an Alnico 2 is a weaker magnet than an Alnico 5, which is a weaker magnet again from an Alnico 8. The strength of the magnet not only determines the output level of the pickup, but also has an influence over its tonality. Stronger magnets give the coil more high-end response, while weaker magnets provide the pickup a more mellow tone. If you've looked at the back of a Fender neck, you'll probably have noticed this stripe of dark wood. Many of you have asked why this is there, and the answer is incredibly simple. This is where the truss rod was installed. Traditionally, fender necks are made from one single piece of maple, just like this one. The fretboard and neck are one continuous piece of wood. So to install the truss rod, fender had to route a slot in the back of the neck to get it in. Obviously the slot then needs to be filled with another piece of wood after the truss rod has been installed, but that presents a small problem. If fender had tried to plug this slot with another piece of maple, it would have looked bad. It would have looked like a repair. You'd have seen the seam lines and where the grain didn't line up. It would have been impossible to make that maple on maple join invisible. So they did the complete opposite and hid the repair in plain sight. By plugging the slot with a contrasting piece of wood, it no longer looks like a repair, rather an intentional design element. It looks like something done deliberately to make the neck look even prettier. And it's worked. The fact that I've had so many questions from people asking what the purpose of this stripe is shows that Fender have hidden the repair so well that people have got no idea it's a repair at all. Obviously routing the back of the neck is unnecessary if you're using two separate pieces of wood for your neck and fretboard. In such circumstances you'd route your slot on the inside surface of the neck, install the truss rod and then cover the whole lot with the fretboard. However, if you have your heart set on a one-piece neck and fingerboard, then a skunk stripe is your best option for hiding your truss rod installation point. Let's stay on Fender guitars for a minute. One of the more noticeable design elements on the Strat, and the Tele for that matter, is the slanted or angled bridge pickup. Here we see the neck and middle pickups parallel to the frets, but the bridge pickup is doing its own quirky lean. Why is that? The answer is again pretty simple. When you strike a guitar string, it vibrates more in the middle than it does towards the bridge. The bridge saddles form a fixed node point of no vibration, so the closer you get to it, the amplitude of the vibration decreases and the tonality changes. 
That means that a vibrating string will sound different along its length, and a pickup under the string will sense the string more strongly at the neck, where the vibration is fullest, and weaker at the bridge, where the vibration is more limited. If you could slide the neck pickup down towards the bridge while you are playing, you'd not only notice the drop in volume, but also the change in tone from full and warm to harsh and biting. It's because the pickup will sense the string differently depending where it sits beneath it that angling the bridge pickup is a popular choice, especially with single coils. Moving the bass side of the pickup a little further away from the bridge ensures that the pickup senses the lower strings with a more full vibration, preventing them from sounding too thin and trebly. And having the treble side of the pickup closer to the bridge means that the pickup will sense the upper strings with more high end attack. It's not just the positioning though. The neck and bridge pickup will both be wound differently and often have different magnets in order to balance the sound and output despite the fact that they're under very different parts of a vibrating string. <gasps> Would you look at the time? January's almost over already. The year's racing away from us. It'll be Christmas again before you know it. And what will you have achieved this year? Probably nothing, as usual. But it's not too late to make 2020 the year of exploring new skills, deepening existing passions, and getting lost in your creativity. Skillshare is an online learning community which offers classes designed to be of practical use to your real life and fit around your busy schedule. Why do today what you can put off until tomorrow, right? No, that's the procrastination talking. Skillshare's classes give you hands-on skills that you can put into action right now to improve your career or personal development. Like Jake Bartlett's class in animated lettering within After Effects, which I've been looking into to try and learn some new tricks to improve my animations here in these videos. If you don't want to get left behind as this year passes you by, then click the link in the description to secure yourself two free months of premium membership. That should give you plenty of time to discover just how much you could learn on Skillshare, and you can say without irony that 2020 is the year you got your shit together. Here's one that's been requested many, many times. Ground lifts can appear in lots of different places, but I'm assuming you're seeing them on your DI boxes, pedals, attenuators, or amplifiers next to an XLR connection designated for direct out to connect your device to a recording interface. Ground lift does exactly what it says on the tin. It lifts the ground connection. That is to say, it disconnects it from one end of the XLR cable. A balanced XLR has three pins, two hot wires for carrying the signal, and a ground connection. I've got a video on how balanced cables work right here. The ground connection is very useful, but it can present a problem when connecting your amplifier rig to your recording setup, which are on two separate power outlets. In an ideal world, all ground connections would be at the same potential, but this is very seldom the case. When connecting two different systems together, like your amplifier to your recording interface, you might find that the two grounds sit at different potentials, allowing a current to flow along that XLR cable. This flow of current can cause hum in your audio signal, which is undesirable. One simple and easy solution to eradicating this hum is to lift the ground connection at one end of the XLR, keeping the two grounds separated and preventing current flowing between them. Note that both systems are still safely, but independently connected to the respective grounds. The ground lift is simply preventing the XLR cable from bridging the two together. When should you use the ground lift? Well, if you connect your amplifier or DI box to your interface and you don't get any hum, then great! You don't need to use the ground lift. However, when you're connecting your two systems together, if you get detrimental ground hum in your audio signal, then consider lifting the ground and seeing if that makes a difference. The clue to this one is again in its name. If a pickup is microphonic, then it is behaving like a microphone. That is, it will be directly influenced by mechanical vibrations in the pickup and not just the string interacting with its magnetic field. The cause of a microphonic effect in a pickup is again the same as what causes a microphone to generate an electric current. Moving parts within the device. Where a microphone will have a diaphragm of some description which vibrates with incident sound waves, by the way, check out my video on how microphones work, it's really good, a microphonic pickup will have loose coils or other parts which vibrate and move with any physical shock to the instrument. 
This results in a pickup that will feed back wildly and replicate any movement or knock taken to the instrument as it shakes the loose components within the pickup. A lot of vintage pickups were like this and a lot of care to be taken on stage to prevent feedback. Even being too close to the transformer of the amplifier could cause problems, so finding the right space on stage where none of those effects happened was vital. The easiest way to prevent a pickup from becoming microphonic is to submerge the entire unit in molten wax. This fills all the air spaces as the liquid seeps between the coils and into all the crevices of the pickup. When removed from the wax bath, the wax solidifies holding all the coils and elements of the pickup in place, preventing them from moving independently to the entire unit. This process is called potting. I use a mixture of paraffin and beeswax to pot the pickups that I make. Paraffin alone solidifies too brittle and would risk breaking apart with vibrations over time, allowing microphonics to manifest. So beeswax is added to the mixture to give it more pliability so that it can hold everything together without breaking itself apart over time. Beeswax on its own has too low a melting point which would risk it turning to liquid and running out of the pickup if the guitar were out on a hot day, something that's very unlikely to happen here in Scotland, but if you lived in somewhere like Arizona, that might be a real threat. Pickups can also be potted in epoxy or resin if you want to completely entomb them forevermore, but this does make it impossible to do any repair work on these pickups. Wax is far more forgiving in this regard. Of course there are many players who will claim that they prefer the sound of microphonic pickups because when they're not doing all of that feedback stuff and amplifying your own voice etc, they apparently sound more lively than potted coils. Frankly it seems like a lot of hassle for what is essentially a badly made pickup and I wouldn't expect any modern player to put up with that inconsistency and irritating performance from their instrument. That's been five tiny tatas that have hopefully given you some insight into these commonly confusing topics. If you've got any questions of your own that you are too afraid to ask, please do leave them in the comments section below and perhaps they'll become the topic of a future Tata video. It's never too late to learn. And if you've liked this video and you want to see more content from me, then please do consider hitting that subscribe button and smashing that notification bell so you can be notified of all new content as it comes out. My Patreon's also there for exclusive secret stuff, t-shirts are available and there's other videos you might not have seen. But that's all for now guys, keep it loud and I'll see you later. Taking a swig of my jig.